na posljednji program trećeg dana trećeg internacionalnog festivala književnosti Bukstan. Veliko nam je zadovoljstvo što večeras, zahvaljujući Aleksandru Saši Hemanu, možemo ugostiti Davida Mičela, bestseller autora kojeg je 2007. godine magazin Time uvrstio na popus od 100 najutjecajnijih ličnosti na svijetu. Također nam je veskrajna čast što smo u izdavačkoj kući Bajbuk objavili njegov bestseller naslov Atlas oblaka, a naravno nam je i zadovoljstvo pored Davida Mičula pozdraviti Aleksandra Zašu Hemona, našeg suosnivača, kuratora prvog bukstana, autora našeg generalnog slogana No East, No West, zahvaljujući kojem možemo u Sarajevo i pred domaću publiku pozvati i dovesti ovakve autore i autorice. Reći ću vam da i sutra na istom mjestu, u isto vrijeme, razgovaramo sa Sašom Hemanom o njegovoj novoj knjici koja nam je danas stigla u knjižaru Bajbuk. Moderator razgovora bit će John Freeman, također suosnivač Bukstana. Program posljednjih dana sutra počinjemo u pola 12 sa predstavljanjem osnovskog hercegovačkih autorica Nine Tikliša i Senke Marić. Hvala vam što ste i večera s nama i što ste između futbala i Bukstana izabrali Bukstan. Znam da je Saši Hemanu taj izbor bio težak i to doživljavamo kao dodatni komplement. Saša i Dejti, hvala vam. Izvolite. Hvala vam, Stina. Hvala vam što ste bili, a što ne pratate u takmicu. Evo, ja ću se pre vas na engleski zbog Davida, jer to je naš kolosak i prijatelj. Ali prije toga, u svoje lične ime zove da zašto. So, thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you for helping me host David Mitchell, who is one of the great writers, among the greatest writers in the English language today. He is also a very close and good friend of mine, one of my favorite human beings. And so I appreciate you are welcoming him to my own town. I owe, I owe you for that. Um, David Mitchell does need a great introduction. Um, in, he started publishing um, in 2000, 99? 99, and in 2003, Granta Magazine included him in the, every 10 years Granta Magazine um, publishes a special issue of the uh, top young uh, British authors. So in 2003, David was included in that edition, and he lived up to the expectations, to say the least. He has published a number of best-selling books, uh, the, and the most recent one is The Slate House, before there was The Bone Clocks. The Slate House and The Bone Clocks are connected in various ways. Cloud Atlas, I was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, was uh, made into uh, a film, which we both love. And, um, his books have sold all over the world. He's a huge star in China. And uh, <laughs> finally, we have, he's been chased, chased down the streets of Shanghai by his Chinese fans. At that time, he entered the school. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Tavon Atlas, Atlas Obarka, um, available, um, thanks to, to buy book. Um, I will let David talk because he's a, he's a beautiful talker and he has a lot of things to say. I will start with the beginning um, because it interests me personally and also I think it's always an interesting story about writers because there's always that moment between not being a writer and being a writer, between writing things for yourself and maybe for a friend's death and then suddenly um, you are a major presence in the literature. David's first book, Ghost Written, was in, published in 99 in the UK. Uh, yes, I think it's a long time ago, but I get a bit hazy on dates. Back in the last millennium, it was published, but it's one of the most impressive first novels in the English language in recent memory. So I would like to ask you about that time of uh, how did you get to write Ghost Written, your first book, and about the transition from being um, um, an unknown author to being one of the major names in, in English language literature. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, and just before I answer, uh, I would also like to say thank you very much for being here. It's Belgium versus Brazil, folks. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> uh, however, uh, I think 
I can, I can say, uh, yeah, two zero still. Uh, um, okay, we have a little screen. Just, um, um, so if you see it, it's, too good. it's not you. It's, uh, um, um, but thank you very much for being here, and thank you for welcoming me to your remarkable city. Um, and then we're going to embarrass our um, simultaneous translator and also thank um, Ivana and Anita who are doing that magical thing where they're interpreting <coughs> what I'm saying now into another language at the very same time that I'm saying it. These two are so good, sometimes they interpret it before I actually say it, which is really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have a question, sir. Um, how did I first get published? Um, how did you start writing? How did you get into that? Ghost written, it has been translated, these languages. It's an enormously complicated book. It takes place in Hong Kong and Mongolia, and it is good. And uh, I can't remember all, all the place, but no, it's, it's all, it takes place in all over the world. It is not just a, a small little book by a story writer, it's as ambitious as can be. I wrote it because I didn't feel like a novelist, and I'm still not really sure if I am a novelist. Uh, I think I write long, short stories, uh, but I glue them together, or put them together like Lego, and I build novels out of shorter forms. Um, generally, I've always done that. So, this was true at the beginning as well. Uh, I was traveling, I was living in Japan, I took about a year off, and I traveled back to your overland via Hong Kong, China, Macau, and Mongolia, and Russia. And when I traveled, I had my notebook, and uh, I often travel on my own, so I spend a lot of time sitting in restaurants and cafes on my own. Now, if you're on your own with nothing to do, everyone thinks, ha, look at that strange, sad foreigner on his own in the corner. If you have a notebook, you look enigmatic, you look possibly dangerous. Um, certainly, the quality of the food goes up and the portions get bigger, because people think you're reviewing the food. Uh, but what I was also doing was recording my memories of the day, uh, just things I didn't want to forget. Uh, these turned into stories, and at some point I had the idea, what if I connect the stories like a line of dominoes, and every story depends on the story before happening the way it happens. Uh, this was an attractive idea. I was 28, uh, impetuous. That's a very good word, impetuous. I say impetuous in Bosnian. I didn't know what not to do. Uh, and this is a gift that you have. You know, yeah, classy. Um, <laughs> It's great. Um, I've, I've known Sasha for years as an Anglophone, and of course, when he's speaking his native tongue, he's a slightly different Sasha to my eyes. It's wonderful seeing you in your just luxuriate in your own language. I mean, you're a master of English, damn you. But, uh, but, but, um, but it's just great to see you with the same and slightly different. Anyway, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, so that was the first book, really. Uh, at, what point, at what point did you think I could actually publish this? I mean, did you have a, a goal in mind from the beginning? Oh, when I'm ready, this is publishable, I just need to finish it, and then uh, the fame and will come. Or was it inching toward it and thinking, wait, this is actually not that bad? And, Maybe I can publish this and then, and then, and then. I, I honestly didn't think about it, and I still try hard not to think about it. I think we are 
are two things. We are a writer and an author. For me, the writer is what you do. It's working. It's my, in my hand, in my notebook, uh, put it onto a laptop. And then the author is who I am now, uh, or who I am when I'm a book tour, who I am when I'm doing an, an interview. And uh, they're different jobs. And I try to put the author in a little box, in a little 10% of my time box, 10% of my year box. Uh, I don't think the author is very good for the writer. The writer is good for the author, but it's not so the author for the writer. If you start to think, oh, this may be famous. Will this change where I live? Uh, will this increase my number of Twitter followers? Then, then this, 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 is, this is bad news. This, um, this poisons something that shouldn't be poisoned. Uh, so I do my best to not think about it. That was true at the beginning, because I wasn't yet an author, I was just a writer. After your first book, sure, then you become an author, and you have to think about these things. But um, no, it's, 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 it's at no point to think, hey, I could publish this. All I thought about was how can I make this damn book good? Uh, how can I successfully wrestle this monster of warm blue tack? What's blue tack in uh, it, it's, 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 it's little blue stuff that you. Uh, I think I've been German. <laughs> uh, it's how no, you put things onto walls before post it notes. Yeah. Um, Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, Crowdsource translation. Of all of the words are actually German. Spenner, like the United States. Because we have very low level of technological consciousness in Russia. That's, 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 that's my answer pretty much. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not good to think about reception. It's not good to think about how this will be reviewed. Uh, it's, it's, it's only good to think about you were the manuscript. But how did you know it was good? I didn't, and I still don't. <laughs> Thank you. Really. It's a nice place, I The most written was remarkable, and it, it's a remarkable book. It, um, it has aged very well, and we really, really good. Um, I'd like you to also. <laughs> and uh, the, the following book was uh, Dream Number uh, number Nine Dream. Um, and then it was Cloud Atlas. Yeah, yeah, which is just out today in, in Bosnia. Atlas of Water, Cloud Atlas. Cloud Atlas, for my money, is one of the greatest novels of the 21st century already. How can I sit here with this? Thank you, sir. I will, I will torment him by describing it because it's far more complex than that. It takes place over about 500 years. So it's in the 18, I mean, 19th century, 1860s or so, right? And then uh, has six distinct <coughs> time periods that it covers. 1860s, 1930s, 1970s, contemporary time, near future, and the far future. Over about 500 years. Um, it starts with the 1860s and it ends with the 1860s. It has a kind of a butterfly structure, right? So the, the far future is in the middle. And so David, in the most remarkable feat of novelistic writing that I've seen, uh, goes to those peers, changing the language and sensibilities and inhabiting all those characters. All of those um, chapters or uh, parts of uh, narrated in the first person, and each of them has a different tone and diction. For the far future, he practically invents the language, which is um, uh, up there with Shakespeare, I would think, in terms of invent language of invention. Um, it was enormously successful um, and deserved it, so it was short visit for the Book of Press. What I want to know is how, if you could be more specific, rather than just writing your short stories and then they add it up, how did you come up with that whole um, structure and, and how did you find a way to inhabit all those periods in human history, some of which has not even taken place yet? Uh, the answer to part one is quite easy. Uh, it was, so I came up with this sort of matriarchal structure out of a frustration with 
uh, a book by Italo Calvino, the Italian novelist called Evaluating by the Prosa, where he, it is, it's, it's a pretty great book. He um, starts the narrative and after a few pages stops it. And then there's sort of meta in between narrative where he, um, where the character, who is you, <laughs> the reader, tries to find a continuation of the interrupted narrative. And you find the manuscript, but instead of being that one, it's a new one. And at first you think, oh, I wanted uh, a continuation. But actually this one's, the, the new one's really good as well. So you read that a few pages, then it stops, sometimes in the middle of a sentence, roughly. And then you're back to your search for a continuation of the one you just read. Uh, it's like Scheherazade and um, unfulfilled desire. That's a bit of a me too thing to say, isn't it? Um, it, it it's it's, it's Scheherazade without the classification of the completed narrative. Scheherazade without the morning after, without the next day, without the continuation. And he does this for about 15 times. Each of the sections is good, but ultimately I felt frustrated that he had not honoured the contract of finishing what uh, he had begun. Uh, of course, this contract is one of the themes of the book. It's a postmodern classic of metafiction. It is about the act of fiction. Uh, so my frustration is maybe naive, uh, but I still felt frustration is real. And perhaps this is why literary postmodernism ended up being a <coughs> cul-de-sac. It, it's, it, it's ultimately a little bit sterile because it, 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 it is about the violation of the contract. Anyway, this is literary theory and it's um, far too beautiful a night to Sorry, to go down there to um, So I just thought, what if you put a mirror at the end of this book? Uh, what would that look like? So you do get the continuations, but in reverse order. I've had this thought when I was about 18 years old, when I met Carl Bonner. Uh, and then that thought stayed with me for about 13 years, until I needed to write a third book. And I was an impetuous youth. <laughs> and I thought, why not? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> uh, these days, I might not, I might not even begin to do all because I know what can go wrong. Uh, but over a career, this is the trade-off. You start off young and impetuous, and the spirit of why not? You don't have the technique, but that's okay. Instead, you have to why not? Then you get older. And the, the, this, this, this audacity of youth kind of declines. But then, with luck, you have the technique to compensate for that loss. One of the great, or the great uh, theme of trial actions, but also ghost written, and the bone box too, is um, transmigration of sorts. The idea that People have visual lives and visual identities and subjectivities, but that they could be inhabited by other people in the form of souls. The whole premise of Farm Atlas is that um, in all of those um, different time periods, there is a, um, a continuity of kind of spiritual, intellectual um, subjectivity, uh, presence of subjectivity, right? So that the people who are 300 years in the future and the people in the 1860s are connected in some way. Uh, this is a, a theme and each of them is repeating their books in the first book, in the third book, and in uh, one of them, and your last two books, The Slate House, is also connected to that. Where does the interest come from? That, that idea that people are people, they're themselves, but they're also someone else at the same time, that they could be containing other people. From two places. The first place is from the fact that I don't want to die. I never want to die. <laughs> if someone could help me with that, that would be great. Uh, I know people who know people. 
I can help you. Um, I write about mortality by writing about immortality. Uh, writing about mortality directly has been done really well by many of the world's great novelists already. Um, and I don't want to compete with them, but by writing about the same songs moving between bodies forwards through time, uh, this one, round clocks, this is a more central thing. Um, then I'm writing about a way of cheating death. And maybe it is a deniable metaphor, good luck with that, a deniable metaphor, a metaphor which, if you accuse it of being a metaphor, it can say, no, no, I'm not a metaphor, no, nope, I'm just, I'm just what I am. Uh, but actually, it's a metaphor for the book. Uh, perhaps I can, perhaps a little part of me can continue after I die. Perhaps art is, 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 is a slight, it's, it's, it's an attempt to end Fox death. It's many other things as well, but um, when I write about what I've been discussing, then I'm, I'm sort of exercising my desire to out fox death. Uh, that was a part. That was part one of a part two. And so what's part two? Part two. Yeah. Um, I like to believe that we are interconnected. I like to believe that what happens in a valley in Bosnia matters to the whole of our species in some, in some way, even if it's very small. I like to think that reality is a matrix of cause and effect. Uh, I like to think we are individuals, but we are also one. Uh, I like to believe that, uh, as our friend Barbara Chensky uh, wrote, um, I am also a we. Uh, I need to believe this, in fact, um, and I think this is on every page of everything I've ever written. I was really in those with you today, and there's a sentence that says, I am not a we yet. <laughs> yes, uh, in ghost written, a soul is married in one of the chapters. It's the actual soul that is moving between people, we can call it soul, but presence, um, uh, a consciousness is moving between people. At some point, this is looking for the origin story and is looking for the possibility that there might be other beings like that. And uh, he or she says, I'm not a video. Um, I think, yes, but I stole that from the last of Mohicans. <laughs> Everything is constant somewhere. Yes. But in the light of what you said, I, um, all of the parts of Cloud Atlas and of Ghost Ripley and of the Bone Clocks. Uh, and you, there are very few writers who are better at uh, writing in first, narrating in first person, which really means inhabiting the minds of someone else, right? In uh, the Bone uh, uh, Clocks, too, but in Cloud Atlas, there's a, uh, an American, uh, uh, what's his first name, Ewing? Dr. Yoon, Adam. Adam Yoon, who narrates in the tone and diction of the 1860s American fiction. Um, then there's a, 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 a anamnesis of a composer in, in um, Holland, and then there's a reporter, and then there's a, a, a publisher, and they all, and then um, a person who is trying to escape a, a dystopian future in Korea and then the far future where after the event where much of life on Earth was extinct. Each of these things is narrated in first person and the narrator, David, or David inhabits the narrator fully, right? You would not be able to deduce what David's biography was from these narrators, right? They have their own subjectivities, their own stories, their own jokes, their own language. Uh, so what is fascinating to me as a writer, uh, I can write in the first person that usually ends up being me. You know, right? 
I'm not saying thank you because we love you. <laughs> it does wear out. <laughs> but but um, how how does how does that what I want to ask is how does it work in relation to this um, drive towards a shared experience of being in the world? You know, these people are highly highly individualized, and they also fit into this larger plan of the world being populated by interconnected people, between whom among whom souls can be passed. I wish that my answer could be as eloquent as your question. I fear it won't be. Provided the answer to the box, this is a super answer. Um, but it can only be shared meaningfully if they are different. Uh, you see what I mean? It, it, it's, it only works if they're different. If they're the same, then where's the sharing? Where is the tolerance, where is the sympathy and the empathy? Sympathy and empathy are basically the same thing these days, aren't they? Uh, so they must be. Um, so that's how it... I'm oh, sorry, my answer is that short. That's how it works. Um, if they're not different, then there's no sharing. Uh, that makes sense to me, so that what we share is the difference. Such that everyone is individualized, and everyone is individualized by sharing different things, in a sense, right? That is, everyone has a, a place of origin, everyone has a, a their life story, everyone has a, a, a set of sensory experiences that formulate their response to the world. And everyone, in other words, consists of the same parts, differently compounded. That is true. Uh, it is true that What we feel as human beings, I think, is universal to our species. How we express it varies enormously from region to region, sometimes from street to street. Um, what I also, I guess, wanted to say is that the glue that binds us together, that makes a society work, or a country work, or a culture exist, or the planet work uh, at, a human, at the level of human beings is that we have to give and take. You cannot get your own way all the time and have peace. Uh, you know more about this than I do. Uh, and my characters need to be so different because if they're not, then where's the humanity? It's easy if you're the same tribe, it's easy if you have the same flag, it's easy if you have the same language. It gets hard when you start looking different and sounding different and maybe believing in different gods. That's the tricky part. But, but that's why when we are at our best, uh, which is not often enough, but it happens sometimes on beautiful, rare occasions, when we're at our best, gosh, we're capable of so much. So much. Um, I don't know if I'm rambling or being profound, but I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, just to, to follow up on that, and this is just to prompt you to simplification, but let's say that there are at least two kinds of literature. One of them is kind of neo romantic that finds ways to express the sensibility of the author in the most direct way, whether it's poetry or just talking about oneself. In various sort of, um, and they could overlap these two kinds of literature. The other one is, and I, I cannot think of anyone that is better at that David Mitchell, is inhabiting other people and doing so essentially as a writer, becoming someone else. Right? No one that I know in the English language at least covers such a range of areas, <coughs> and those written contains a, 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 an old Chinese woman, right, who has a tea shop and a holy mountain somewhere in China. It also includes a, a, a British a Welsh uh, a, a lawyer who works in Hong Kong. Um, and, uh, a cloud atlas contains the narrator who's living 500 years or 300 years from now, uh, speaking his own language. So to me, it seems that you represent, in the best possible sense, the kind of literature that requires from the writer and therefore from the reader 
to become someone else. In some ways, it's an anti-identity uh, politics move. Uh, and not anti in the sense of confrontation, but in the, in the sense of the opposite direction, which we all need in the end. Uh, and it requires from the reader to abandon the expectations, because if I read about someone who's um, speaking and living and trying to survive 300 years from now, I have to abandon the expectations of my particular circumstances of living at this particular time, being represented in that kind of direct way. There has to be some kind of negotiation of finding the common ground, that is, which requires for me to become that person, to imagine myself being in the position in the mind of that person. What about your response to this proposition? Uh, I'll respond, I think this time maybe my answer will be longer than the question, which is good news. <laughs> but, um, firstly, I do sometimes feel like an imposter at literary festivals, especially when you have a day of really sharp intellectual minds speaking with beautiful precision, often not even in the speaker's native language. Um, I'm not an intellectual. Uh, I, of course, I'm curious about the world, I'm fascinated by the world, but I'm not an intellectual who can also write fiction. I can only really write fiction. Um, for me, what I do is made of five things. It's made of plot, character, style, um, ideas, and structure. And the ideas need to be there, uh, otherwise it's, it's an airport novel. It might be entertaining, but you forget the day after you've read it. Uh, however, for me, in proportion, really, I, I, I think of ideas as yeast. Uh, not a lot of yeast in a loaf of bread. Maybe it's the plot and characters, especially the characters that really, that really drive the thing for me, that really engage me, that fascinate me. Uh, human beings are so fascinating. Uh, how, how, how the soul, how the mind expresses itself. Uh, why we're so different? How come? That basic question is, is infinitely Fascinating. Um, I am, of course, very pleased when people like aspects of my writing, so I am pleased inwardly when people compliment me on my powers of characterization. But I'm also slightly baffled, I'm also slightly confused, and, and a part of me wants to respond, well, that's just what a novelist does. It's like complimenting. The football has screens gone blank, so for all I know, Brazil has scored four goals. But it's like complimenting the footballer uh, on being, on playing the football. It, it's, it's like complimenting the person, the architect who designed this impressive building on being a good architect. It, it's, it's their job. It's my job to write these characters. Um, and I'm not that interested in me. I, 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 I'm interested in other people. Uh, I don't really want to spend years of my life with made of people who are like me. That would be like being locked inside that being John Malkovich film. <laughs> um, never being able to get out. It, it's, the more different to me a character is, the more interesting <coughs> And the more different to me a person is, in many ways. Um, if, if, uh, Similarities between things and the differences between things. This is this is this is this is why I love life. This is why this is why I want to write. Uh, what are they? How come? So so yes, uh, I I spend my life with all uh, novelists. I spend my life with non-existent people. I spend more time with non-existent people than with family and my kids and my friends. Uh, and this isn't a, this isn't a poor me uh, 
tragic situation. I, I, I love doing this. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I like to write letters for them to me. Uh, I, 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 I like to get them to write to me and tell me what they think about maybe ten things about the novel that they are living inside. And you actually write letters from characters to yourself? Yeah, yeah they're my level. Uh, what do they think about money, God, sexuality, politics, work, work's an important one. Um, it has to be in their own language because then you get a relationship with language. And this is very, very, this is close to the core of who we are. What's a relationship with language? How do we express ourselves? Do we, do we struggle with language? Are we, are we master artists with language? Uh, do we use words like impetuous? Or mellifluous, or <laughs> quotidian. <laughs> this is so rude. <laughs> uh, it's uh, or do they use words like um, a good um, impetuous, um, rash, impulsive, or a synonym for uh, mellifluous, um, verbal? Uh, or, what, what was the last one? Quotidian, or <laughs> everyday, or normal. Um, and when you get, when you get how a character speaks right, then they're halfway there. Um, I, I love this, and I, I, I worked with David, and I'll talk about it in a minute. And I, one of the many things I admire about him, he pays attention to details, the smallest details because they are really important to the character of the mayor. But at the same time, um, it, what depends on those details are exactly those great ideas. And I, I would like to put forth this to you, that uh, the idea, um, which I, I believe about a lot, is that literature is, a, is an epistemic system. It's a system of knowledge, as it were, that provides access to a kind of knowledge that is not available otherwise and that it could be generated and accessed by way of merit. So when you say that you're not intellectual, it just means that you're not formulating as a scholarly intellectual in quotation marks terms, but that you're thinking within the merit, and that the ideas that are generated by way of innovation, by way of creating those um, characters, by way of paying the attention to the smallest details that pertain to those characters, is in fact a great engine for great ideas. And to, uh, here's one idea. I have discovered in thinking and reading about David and talking to people about sensei and all other things, there's a whole um, <coughs> field in the English literature studies that is about post human things, right? David Mitchell is a major figure in post human studies because a lot of your books contain as it were, the next step in the evolution of humans. Right? The humans, not just those who are in the future, but who are expanded beyond the quotidian humanity. Because as much as I like the idea of being inhabited by a soul, I do not feel it. I have a mind that cannot really think itself. And what you can do in the narrative is expand that mind so that we can imagine a different form of being a human being with the presence of some hypothetical real soul consciousness within my own consciousness. Um, so that, what I want to ask you this, this I don't want to get into this, I want you to ask you about the ways in which you pursue those ideas. You know you, you talked about them, you know that they're present in your work, but how do you, how do you get them? How do you get the idea that there's more to human beings than just um, being in this place right now? How do you, I don't know how you get it in terms of intellectual, but how do you develop it in the narrative? <coughs> Ooh. Uh, um. It's my job. 
Um, <laughs> yes, but because you chose it, but you don't have to choose it. What would I be without my body? Uh, I, it, 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 it's, it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's arithmetic. Uh, me minus my body, what is left? How would it think? Um, is the Cartesian divide between the mind and the body without my depth? Uh, that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, does it? Yeah. No. No. I put that in. Was he right? Is that split real? Or is it true that the body is merely the outermost layer of the onion of the self and the mind is somehow inside that? And perhaps a soul inside the mind. I doubt that there is a human language in existence that hasn't got a word for the soul. Yet we have no idea what it is. Um, Dusha, I thought. Is it? Dusha. Again? Dusha. It's also connected to Duk, which is spirit. Okay. Which is spirit in the sense of you know, the ethereal presence, but also Duk as in human spirit. Like, um, um, there are people who believe, and for some reason, there is a Duk of Sari, a spirit of Sari, a sort of shared. That's an example of how a language isn't just a lexical system, it is it's also a way of perceiving reality. And that's why we should all study as many as possible. Uh, you're not just studying the language, you're studying the interpretation of reality. Um, what would I be without my body? And how would what is left think? That's a nightmare to translate. Don't worry about that. Okay. I'm so interested in what they do now. I mean, uh, I, I, I've done a little bit of everything. Um, they're some of the smartest people in the room, and, um, and we should give them a round of applause at the end, so get ready. Um, but, um, yeah, what would I, um, how would, how would me without my body think? Um, I find that really interesting, and I like to think about it, and um, whatever they are worth, the fruits of my thoughts sort of sweep in and out of my books quite often. Uh, it's, it's, it's something I return to. I, 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 I'm not sure, I'm not even sure if I believe in a soul. Perhaps if I was more sure about the existence of the soul, I wouldn't mind about it. Incorporeal reality has a matter of what incorporeal reality that can't be easy. Best of us. Um, Best of us. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, before we wade into pure abstraction, the cloud atlas was adapted by the Wachowskis of the Major Strain in 2012. David and I met because I was writing a piece for the New Yorker about the making of the film. Um, and follow the development of the script, and this is the first time I, I read about that. I hadn't been aware of its success, but I hadn't read it before. And so um, I watched it develop from afar from a journalistic point of view. I want to ask you what your experience was in, in um, David was involved, and it was important to the Wachowskis that David would prove of that, not just, just by the way. So I want to ask you about your involvement in the film and how you saw uh, the ways in which they solved some of those technical narrative problems, like how to show that souls might be attributed. Well, on that point in particular, it's easier to do in a film than it is in a novel, because you have actors. Uh, they, they really brought this into the foreground. Um, okay, so. Um, hello. <laughs> They had the same actors appearing in six different time zones of the film, but they would change the gender, they would change the ethnicity, and they could do what I couldn't because an actor has a face, so there's the glimmer of recognition. Hang on, that's. 
Tom Hanks here, and he was a captain. No, 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 he was, he, he was there. You, you, you get the pleasure of identifying the same actors in different zones of the film. Uh, and it's the same soul. It's the same person moving through time in a very different body. So what the Wachowskis did was to use what only film can do. They, I was really happy, they weren't, they, they were not slavishly faithful to the novel. They made some changes that made it a better film than it would have been had they not done that. Uh, they, this is Lego metaphor number two of the evening, but they disassembled my novel like Lego and then reassembled it, the same bricks, but in a slightly different shape, in the shape of a movie. And that's why they're great filmmakers. Um, it was individually, it, 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 it was a temporary residence visa in the Republic of Filmmaking, which is an amazing place to visit. I'm not quite sure if I'd like to live there uh, because I'm not a filmmaker, but, but an amazing place to visit. And, and I got to spend time with actors. Um, I got to learn how actors can use charisma and inflection and nuance, facial expression to, to turn quite a simple line completely on its head. And that should have taught me earlier than it did that when you're screenwriting, it's always the, the opposite of a novel. As you said, the novel's about the details. Screenwriting is about omitting the details and just having a sort of a haiku-like, simple line that gives the actor space to work with, gives the director the space to work with. So I learned many, many things. And it is a good day when I learn, when, uh, when I learn new things. It's a slightly wasted day when I don't know anything new. Um, David and I were involved in the second season of the Netflix TV show, Sensei. The first season was written and developed by the Wachowskis and, uh, and Joe Straczynski. The season probably was being made. For one reason or another, um, in the second season, Lana Wachowski was the, the showrunner, and David and I, and some other people involved, and, and, and Joe Straczynski, with the uh, showrunners, and David and I were involved in writing the second season. We were going to write the third season last year, this summer, I mean, last year in the summer. And then it was cancelled, but something happened, it's a very short version. And then David and I, Lana Wachowski, wrote the two and a half hour final episode of the show. And we spent the summer working together and wrote another script for, for a hypothetical TV show, which is being shot to run. So we wrote scripts together, is what I'm trying to say. So I want to ask you about your screenwriting experience um, last summer. And then before that, because you already touched upon that. Um, screenwriting and collaboration, artistic collaboration in general, it is either heaven or hell. Uh, if you get the wrong people, it is hell. And I would not wish it on my worst enemy. Or maybe one or two of my worst enemies, but only one or two of them. Uh, if it's the right people, uh, it is heaven, and it is the right people if you can agree on a common modus operandi. Uh, operandus, get my Latin right. Um, we're novelists, normally our lines are colleague-less. We never work with anyone, we have complete creative control. We are horrible little dictators of our universes. Uh, it is not a democracy. It is not a democracy. It's not even a benign dictatorship. It, 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 it's, it's full North Korea without the human rights violations. Uh, but I miss. <coughs> but you also have to do everything. 
every word is yours. You get all the credit and all the blame. Um, and after 15 years of living like this, it was of, of working like this, uh, I, I wanted the experience of working with other people again. Uh, so, I could ask you the same, really, because you were there as well. But um, we developed a way of working. Uh, we referred to ourselves as the pit, uh, which, of course, is a hole in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> a big round hole in the ground, perhaps with wild animals living inside. Uh, and we did this so we'd never have to say you or your idea. We could use language to encourage us to think as a collective, like the Borg collective, if there are any Star Trek fans in the room. Uh, and this made it possible to be critical about the ideas that were put into the pit much more easily than it would have been if we were talking about Sasha's idea or Lana's idea or David's idea. It's, it's the pit's idea. So we did this and we developed two more rules. One, um, don't interrupt, which is a useful rule in any context. It's quite tempting when you're sure you have a better idea, when you're sure that you found a problem in what the other person is saying, it's very tempting, it's a very human reflex to jump in, but we stop doing that. Uh, we allow the other person just to continue their train of thought to the destination. And, and the final rule, the third rule was, you never begin a sentence with the word but, uh, because but, even for a friend, it's a little slap in the face, it's a little poke in your eye. Uh, so, so the rule was and, not but. Even if you wanted to say but, you had to say and. Uh, and this would allow the previous idea to exist, but it would never be shot down in flames. Uh, the previous idea would exist, but it would be uh, compared to idea number two, which, of course, would be more cleaning and magnificent. Uh, and so we'll go for that one, especially if it's my idea. <laughs> there was also a, a variation of and, was what if the start of this problem was saying, what if all that, but then something else too? Yeah. yeah. So what if we open up for questions? Ooh, right. that's all we did now. I can leave my whole Sasha Segway here. <laughs> yes. Is, is, is there a microphone? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Hello. Hello. Thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for being um, I have a couple questions for you on space, but I'll ask first, and if there's some other questions, I'll ask the second one. Okay. Um, so you spent um, some formative time in Japan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A long time. And uh, I want to know how that experience influenced you and your writing. And I also want to know, um, it's, you have Asian characters in your books, and I want to know how you bring authenticity to them. And, um, Asian characters? Yeah, and, sure. and whether you, I assume people in China are running out because they like the characters, so um, do, you, do you think you bring authenticity to them? Do you think that people can go into cultures that aren't their own? Thank you very much for those two questions. I will try to do them justice. Uh, Japan, uh, I lived there from 20, uh, age 24 through to 22. Uh, 24 to 22, that would be, that would be an achievement. <laughs> uh, I need a time machine. I was from 24 to 32. Um, so, before a writer becomes a writer, you acquire life experiences and I think of them as a compass book. And you put everything that happens to you on the compost heap. And much of my compost heap was derived. Then when you are a writer, you use the <coughs> compost from the compost heap to grow things, uh, to grow narratives. Um, 
it's not easy for me to identify quite what parts of my conference team are particularly Japanese, but I just know that there's a lot there. Certainly one of my books is wholly set in Japan, and that book will not exist if I had applied for a teaching job in Singapore or South America or anywhere in Japan. The book is The Thousand Arms of Jacob Brazil. Yeah, this one. Um, A novelist is also a location scout. <laughs> we go through life observing places, learning about places, not only because they're interesting in their own life, because also one day you might want to set something there. Um, it's not a great answer, but it's hard to give a better one. Uh, it's just there in my life, and there in my life experiences, and uh, I speak some of the language, and it's the other language in my house, and my daughter speaks. Japanese, and when my wife and I have an argument, she shouts at me in Japanese. <laughs> and, um, oh gosh, she's been filmed. Uh, I don't argue much, do we? Um, um, so, so, yeah, it's my other language. Uh, I'm far from fluent, but as I was saying earlier, a language is also a, a way to perceive reality and it is through the, the lens of the Japanese language that's my way of perceiving uh, reality. It's, it, it, it's my strongest of the language. Your, uh, your second question. Um, I cannot know if I write Asian characters authentically. Um, should I even try? Uh, I hope so, because if I because the reverse of logic is not pretty. The reverse of logic is that I only have any kind of a right to write about uh, white male middle-aged English guys. Uh, uh, I'm not knocking that. I'm not knocking writers who are more at home with that. To do, but I would hate to tell a Japanese or an Asian writer they have no right to attempt to write a Caucasian <laughs> character. I wouldn't do that. Uh, I would, I would see what they write. Maybe, maybe it's no good. Uh, maybe it's not very authentic. Maybe, maybe they make a ton of mistakes. Uh, Maybe it reeks to high heaven of inauthenticity. They tried and failed, and the sky will not fall down. Um, I'm fascinated by Asia. It's 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 a part of it's part of my life in most senses of that phrase. Uh, I write about what I am fascinated by, um, and to not even try would be an act of self. Censorship, and I think perhaps an act of imaginative self-harm. Um, if Asian readers think that I've done a terrible job, then then I would regret that. Um, if they are articulate, I will try to learn from them and find out where I've gone wrong and how I can fix it in the future. But I do want to try. Uh, the genius of the novel is to allow you to inhabit somebody else's skin, to be someone who you are not. I'm sure most languages have a proverb um, equivalent to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. Just to be someone else, to view a situation from someone through somebody else's eyeballs, through someone else's mind. And um, I don't want to not try to do that. This is, this is, this is what novels are so good at. Um, I don't want to try to do the world through eyeballs that are not David Mitchell, that are not mine. I just refer to myself in the third person, which is a habit of Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> is that okay for that dude? Thank you.
uh, any more, any more of these discussions?